Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to today's masterclass, which is the last masterclass that we've organized for 2020. Before I get started, I'd like to pay my respects to the lands on which we gather here today, the, the people of the Kulin and the Wurundjeri uh, people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their leaders past and present and emerging. And to also the other lands that you are gathered on today, uh, wherever they may be in Australia, uh, and many people, some people also overseas. Today's masterclass, um, as I mentioned a moment ago, is the last masterclass for the business school, for the Monash Business School in 2020. Uh, this has been an extraordinary year. It's seen us alter our formats. It's seen us alter our style, each one of us in our respective domains. Um, and it's been terrific to have uh, the audience continue to participate in these events. We, we really do feel that they are important. Uh, they're part of our social contract, if you like, to bring the latest intellectual thinking to the public for debate, discussion, and reflection. Today's topic, data analysts, what skill sets do these jobs require, is led by Dr. Patricia Menendez uh, from the Monash Business School, the Department of Econom Econometrics and Business Statistics. It's a terrific topic because, as we know, we are going through a, yet another industrial revolution at the moment where data analysis is becoming ever more important as we gain access to better hardware and software. As with all industrial transformations, this stirs up the need for us to acquire new skills uh, and new ability, capabilities, if you like, to make full use of the productive potential that is available from this technology. So without further ado, Patricia, I pass it over to you. To the audience, we do very much value your, well, your questions. Uh, please submit them via the Q&A. And uh, later in the presentation, uh, we'll turn to an, an open discussion, which I'll lead and I'll, I'll draw on the questions that you've, you've submitted. Uh, and Patricia will do her best to answer them. Once again, thank you very much, Patricia, and thank you to the audience for being uh, in attendance today. Many thanks, Edward. And um, good afternoon, all, and, and thank you for attending this afternoon masterclass. It's great to have you all here. Um, so let's get started. Today, um, I'm going to, to, to tell you a little bit about my story and my journey in data science. Uh, what were the challenges that I faced? Um, how did I navigate the waters? What were the joys? What were the things that I felt I was very well prepared? And what were the things that I had to learn on the job? So um, I'm a lecturer at the Department of Econometrics and Business Statistics, and um, I, I kind of had an academic career until 2013. And then I realized that I had a lot of experience, a lot of academic experience and a very strong background, which I will tell you more about in a minute, but that I didn't have enough, enough experience with the real world data. So I decided to leave academia for a few years, like almost six years and go and work for government and with industry to, to learn what is it to deal with data in the real world. So I'm going to tell you all about that today. But let's start um, from the beginning. Um, as Edward already mentioned, we are currently facing, experiencing the fourth industrial revolution. And what is it driving the fourth industrial revolution? It's data. Um, According to the CareerCast website that did a study in 2019, the top jobs in the US were data scientists and statisticians. Both of those were expected to grow. And I'm sure this year with the pandemic that we are experiencing and, and um, the realization that people with um, quantitative and analytical skills are really needed. I'm sure that these expectations this year are much greater. So what, what is a data analyst or a data scientist? Uh, if you browse the net, you will find thousands of different definitions. So um, 
data science is a very broad field. It's also somehow a new field. Um, so I decided that today we are going to start, I will start telling you what is my definition. So my definition about what a data analyst or data scientist is, is the following one. A data analyst or a data scientist is a professional who analyzes, sometimes collects, sometimes don't, data, is a professional that also interprets data, and it does all those things using statistical, mathematical, and computational methods. So this is my definition. I know it's a very broad definition, but I purposely thought that data science is a very diverse field. Um, there are people working in this field that come from many different backgrounds and that work in different domains within data science. So a, a kind of a broad definition, in my opinion, is required to be able to accommodate all these professionals who work within the data science. All right, so I, I already hinted you about this, but I, I'm sure many of you already know. There are multiple doors to get into the field of data science. During my career, especially during the years that I work outside of academia, I met professionals working in data science that were amazing and that they came from originally maybe a biology background or, or a social science background or a marine um, biology background. And those people, they kind of, they acquire the required skills to become data scientists. And they were working as data science in, scientists in their fields, like in the field of biology or in the field of social science. And some others also, they cross to other fields. So for me, one thing that is, very unique and very special about the world of data science is that there are multiple doors to get into it. And I think that is something fascinating and that diversity also contributes to, to, to the richness of the field. So as anybody else who works in data science, I use one of those door, doors to get into data science. So the door that I used to get into data science was the mathematics and statistics. So my undergraduate and my graduate studies, as well as my PhD, were all in mathematics and in particular in mathematical statistics. So when I studied, which was not that long ago, data science was not something that popular as it is today. It's, it was not even something that people will talk. And on the contrary, when someone will ask me, what do you study or what do you do? And I would say, oh, I'm a mathematician that will put people off, which is something that has changed in the last few years. And now people appreciate that mathematics and statistics is actually all around us. And, and people um, who study these disciplines are like any other one. So that was the door that I used to get into the data science, mathematics and, and statistics. So in my career, that, that um, background, I, I, it has proven to be very useful. So having a very strong quantitative and computational training as the one I had uh, through my studies and my PhD have been really invaluable. And, and I could tell you how many times I had this conversation with people who are working in the field of data science who come from it, a different background, um, they would tell me, oh, I wish I would have learned a little bit more about statistics, mathematics during my studies, because I'm, I'm, I'm studying it now because I need it for my work as a data scientist. So I'm not saying that everybody has to be a mathematician, but in data science, you really need to know certain skills and quantitative and computational training is fundamental. Of course, the depth of which you need to know, it depends on the, on the kind of job that you will be doing within the data science field. And, and we'll talk more about this um, today during the talk. So in particular, the academic skills that I acquire, that I have found, they have been extremely useful during my career, both in academia and also working outside of academia, where the good mathematical and statistical training, um, that has been 
really invaluable when in, in situations when I needed to solve a problem and the standard tools did not work. To have that knowledge and that understanding allowed me to kind of tailor made solutions that were not available. Another thing, another skill that I think in, that I found very useful and that I, nowadays maybe in computer science still people are going through this, but in other fields is not so popular anymore is something called algorithmics. So algorithmics, according to Wikipedia, is the systematic study of the design and the analysis of algorithms. So when I study maths, we learn programming. Um, so the first programming language that I learned was Fortran. But before I learned Fortran, I had to learn how to write an algorithm to solve a problem using algorithmic language. So you will have a problem, like for example, um, create an algorithm that sums numbers. And then you will solve it, you will create an, an, an algorithm that will solve that problem. Then once you know how to solve that problem in an algorithmic way, you can use any programming language and translate that into a given programming language to solve the problem. So this has been um, a knowledge that I found it was very, very useful, um, especially with programming language like Fortran and, and some of the, that kind. Um, with R and Python, they are more forgiving. So maybe um, the algorithmic knowledge um, is also useful, but it's not essential. Although in my view, having algorithmic knowledge is really very helpful. Um, a strong computational skills, if you want to be a data scientist, definitely you need to know um, how to code in different language. You need to know a good coding practices and just practice, 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 and learn from the people who know more than you. Another skill that I had um, that I found it was extremely useful was the problem solving skill, which of course, if you study maths, is something that comes very naturally. Um, so problem, problem solving skill comes together with um, you are given a problem, a real problem. How do you translate that problem into a quantitative problem that can be solved using data science? So if you work um, in the real world for government or industry, your boss will come, they will give you a problem, and then you will have to kind of think, oh, how do I translate this problem into a quantitative one that I can solve using data? So that is another skill that I found it was very useful. And it's a skill that you can always keep on improving. The other skills that I found were very useful that I didn't maybe uh, learn when I was studying was um, to set clear goals and expectations for a project. So if you are, um, there will be situations where you might be the only data scientist um, and the people around you will be people from all the disciplines. So they will come with a problem and they will ask you, okay, this is the problem, this is the data, can you solve it? Um, so there are situations in which the problem can be solved. There are other situations in which you can answer certain questions, but you cannot answer all the questions. So one thing that I learned on the job was that you really need to set clear goals and expectations for a project. And the other thing is that you need to adapt to changes. Um, I remember I, at first when I left academia and I was working um, for the government, there will be this, uh, I will be working in this project and then like we, we set the, the question that we wanted to answer, we have the data and we agree in what are the things that we can answer with this data. And then like a couple of weeks after someone will come, oh, but we have this other data set, can you include it? So one thing that I had to learn when I was working outside of academia is to adapt to changes because things are very, um, yeah, are lively, right? And, and things can change. So you, you have to, to have the ability to adapt to changes and to incorporate new information as it comes because sometimes it happens like that. The other thing that I had to learn because um, in my career, I studied maths and then I did my PhD, which was also a mathematical uh, statistical problem project. And then um, I did a postdoc 
where um, yeah, I, I use kind of like um, statistical and computational tools to solve a, a, a real life problem. But mostly in all these situations, I was surrounded by people who had the same background as I had. So people with the same background tends to have a similar viewpoint, tends to see the things in a similar way. One thing that I found it was really fascinating when I when I was working as outside of academia is that how people with different backgrounds look at the problem in a very different way. So it, to try to understand and to listen to what other people uh, think about a problem or a project is something that is is really invaluable and is something that at first is not easy. I, I personally didn't find it easy because I, I know I knew my the language that I used to communicate. It was my mathematical language, um, which was international. Uh, but when you start talking with people who don't have that background, you need to kind of try to, to understand what they want to say. And you also need to be able to convey the message that you want to convey so they can understand. The other skill that that I had to learn, and I will tell you some story about this, is the capacity to communicate your findings to specialized and broad audiences. And this one is also related to, to the point that I made just now. And um, it's not the same to talk to, the, to a crowd of people who have the same background as you, as to talk to a people who come from many different backgrounds that might not have the knowledge and, and, and the vocabulary that you have in your field. And, and that is something challenging that you learn by doing. So the other skill that I found really useful is like embrace criticism and use it to get better. And this one comes again from the situation when you work in a field, in, in a multidisciplinary project where are people from many different backgrounds. Um, so the way you see things is not the same way the other people see things. And, and the criticisms, mostly they are constructive, but they will really help you to grow and to be able to communicate better. So the last two skills, probably they are not just skills, but they are kind of two things that to me, they are fundamental to the, to the field of um, data science, which are professional integrity, having high standards and ethics. So when we are faced with a problem, we are given data and we are asked to solve a problem or to give an answer to a question, we always need to rely on the data. The data speaks and we need to, um, to, to be able to extract that information objectively and not use any kind of bias in our, in our analysis or in our reporting. So these two um, are definitely kind of fundamental, especially also with, you know, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence and, and all the big data world, but also in the traditional, in the more traditional data science um, inference world, those two are, for me, they are essential. And probably by now you already have gathered that if you like to be in the world of data science, the learning never ends. So there is always something new. There is always a new program. There is always a new package. There is always something new that no matter how long have you been around in the data science world, you don't know and you have to learn. So that is something that I personally find fascinating. The, 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 the continuous learning is, is something your job will never be boring. All right, so I, I, I told you that I will mention something um, about communicating to broad audiences. So when I, um, I finished my PhD and I was offered a postdoctoral position at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. So Wageningen University is a, a very famous agriculture university. So um, the, project in the, the project that I work on during my postdoc was funded by a consortium of um, plant breeding companies. So these companies, they wanted to understand what were the drivers behind tomato flavor. And my job was to kind of um, look into models that will relate the metabolic components of tomato 
with the, 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 the flavors. So um, every three or four months, we will have a meeting where I would report the, the progress to this, to this consortium of companies. So I remember I went to the first meeting all excited um, and I gave my talk and I was really, really very um, excited about all this mathematical development that I had done, all my models. So I start my talk with kind of like setting the scene, all good, and um, some background. And then I started to tell all these companies about all these equations that I used to create my models. And then I kept on looking at this audience like, like breathing, people like, you cannot imagine their faces. So anyway, I finished my presentation and when they, like after the presentation, there was kind of like a, a session to talk to the to the companies and one to one and it I was kind of um, very surprised when they all told me for the next presentation please do not show an equation and then I was I remember at first that was like I couldn't believe because you know I wanted to to show them the needs and grids of my analysis and I wanted them to understand so I, I remember me bargaining with them, but in the next one, at least one equation, but at least one equation. And, and you know, I, this is something that I learned and, um, by doing. You really need to know, you, you really need to learn how to communicate the findings without showing any equation, because otherwise people who are not into maths, people in a broad audience, they don't want to have a death by equations. Right. So, yeah, that, 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 is, that is something that I experienced. And now that I'm telling you, it seems kind of pretty obvious, but it was not obvious to me because of my background and because of with whom I was relating um, in my academic experience. And um, after that, and when I went to industry, it's something that I kept on polishing up and brushing up. Um, so, the other skills that I had to develop during my career were the, the following ones. So I learned that the theory and the practice are two different things. So for me, I had a very strong background on uh, mathematics, statistical inference, probability, probability theory. I, I understand the models and I was also able to decide whether a model is right or wrong. But then when you are given a data set, the data set has always some idiosyncrasies that there is no model that fits 100%. So dealing with data is something that requires a lot of practice. And of course, having the background on the theory of the models help, but analyzing data is a different skill that you learn by doing. And fortunately, nowadays there are degrees where you know, there is a combination um, between theory and practice, um, like the one we have at Monas in the, um, um, the Master of Business Analytics. But when I study, we, we, we crank on the theory and then the, the data was something which appears sometimes. So I had to learn to kind of to meet in the middle point between the theory and the practice. The other thing that I had to learn that I already mentioned is that communicating with people in other disciplines is not easy and requires a lot of practice. So whoever tells you, oh, it's very easy, I can assure you, at least in my experience, it's not easy because it's very difficult to put yourself in someone else's shoes with a different background. Um, so it's something that you learn by doing and that I find is really fascinating, but it requires effort and a lot of practice. And it's something that if you master, it will really take you very far in your data science career. Because at the end of the day, there will be situations where you need to communicate your findings and not only communicate your findings, you will need to kind of being able to talk to people to understand what is what they want to solve. Um, so for that, I, I, I one thing that I have learned is that you have to ask questions. So when someone from a different discipline in a multidisciplinary um, project comes and asks you, okay, we need to solve this question. 
okay, the, the question I'm sure is very clear in their mind, but it might not be that clear in your mind because you might not have the marine biology background or the biology background or the crime background. So you need to really ask questions. This is like when you go to the doctor, the doctor asks you, do you have pain here? Do you have pain there? And like that, they can kind of decide what is the problem. So when you are working in a multidisciplinary team to solve a multidisciplinary problem is the same. You need to learn to ask the right questions so you can frame that problem in a way that you can solve it. And also you, 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 you need to understand if you can solve it or to what extent you can solve it or to what are the questions that you can answer. So it is essential to set real expectations and also deadlines. Um, I, I, there, there has been situations in which I work in a project and my part was just one piece of the, the big, big project, but my piece depending on someone else up in the pipeline to do their thing. So if, if that person or, or that company or that group did not deliver, then I cannot do my thing. And it's the same for the people who come after me. So it, it, one thing that I, I think is very important is to really set real expect, expectations, communicate. Um, you need to do this and you need this much time and you need these resources. And uh, if you are given a data set or a modified data set, the, the data set should come in a similar format because otherwise all the work that you have done is for nothing. Uh, one thing that I, I was very surprising to me when I first started to work outside of academia, I will be given a project, I will start working on the project, creating all the code. And then one week later, someone will tell me, oh, there was a problem in the data set that, that we gave you. So we need to update you with the data. So I said, yeah, no problem. Um, just give me the updated data set. And then you will receive an updated data set, which has a totally different format. So this means that all the coding that you have done is like useless because this data set that is kind of your starting point of your project has a totally different shape. So I learned very quickly that I also needed to kind of to set the expectations. If there is a modification in the data set, that is fine, but I need the data set to have the same format. So these things, they seem very like obvious, but they are not obvious. They were not obvious for the people who were giving me the data and they were, I never thought about this at first until I encountered the problem. So the, the other thing that I, I think is very important and I phrase it here like fresh air is always good. So when you, um, if you work as a data scientist in a big team where there are many other data scientists, probably um, someone has thought about something before you, but when you work in an environment where you are maybe mostly the only data scientist, that you will see things that maybe can be improved because it's what we talk, these things change, computational uh, methods become available. So we can always improve on our analysis. So you will encounter the situation when someone will tell you, oh, well, but we have been doing this for a long time. Why do we need to change it? Um, so, you know, this again comes to kind of like different perspective. Yeah, maybe you have been doing this for a long time and it, it was good, but there is a better way to do it. And um, so that's what I meant with Fresher is always good. And I think it's important as a data scientist that you, you kind of try to convey all this message in a constructive way. And those are skills that I never, I, I didn't acquire during my studies. My studies were more academic and, and these are things that I learned when I was on the job. So when you work for a company or for a government organization, those companies and government organizations, they use data. And what is what they want? They want answers. So to give answers, you need to use your data analyst toolbox. And this is um, kind of very simple. The bigger your toolbox it is, the more things you can solve. So when as a data analyst, I always um, say, you, um, it, it's like driving a car, right? You need to know how to drive the car, but you also need to know about, about the mechanics. 
So when the car, when something is not right, you need to be able to go dig in and fix what is not working. So that's what I mean with a, a data analyst tool, toolbox. You need to know how to solve the problem. Now there is so many softwares that you can pump in data and they will give you an answer, but it, that is not enough. You need to know how to drive that, but you also need to know if what you are using is correct or is not correct and being able to, 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 to assess the assumptions of the methods that you are using. So um, when you create solutions, you also need to know what you are doing. So it's not the same driving a car or knowing, oh, there is a strange noise in my car. Where is the problem? So it's the same with data science. There are solutions that you can use. They are ready-made solutions, but you also, you always need to make sure that those solutions that you are applying, they are correct one. The assumptions are fulfilled. Everything is right. So then you can trust your analysis and your answers. So the companies and governments use data and want answers, but also they want to be able to understand the answers. And this, I come back to what I told you before. It's not the same to, to talk to an specialized audience or to talk to a broad audience. An specialized audience, they will, know to, they will want to know what do you use, what are the methods, what is the need and gritty. But a broad audience, they just want to focus on the answers. So these are the things that you need to kind of to train and to master to, to be very successful in the world of, of data science, in my opinion. So the other thing uh, that I think is very important is to acknowledge that each data set has its own story. So there will be situations as a data scientist that maybe you extract data from the internet and you are the collector of the data. But there are many other situations that someone else will have collected the data. Um, a psychologist, a marine scientist, a biologist, they will come to you with this data. So one thing, um, that is very important is to acknowledge that the people who collect the data, they have really a very good knowledge of the data. Their knowledge is invaluable and having a conversation with them before you start your project is definitely something is, that I have personally found extremely useful. When you do, when you work on a data science project, the context to me is fundamental to the analysis and it's also essential for the storytelling of your project. So it's not that you have to become an expert in marine science, but you can have a conversation with the people who collect the data, who, with the marine scientists experts. That to me is the essence of multidisciplinary work. And that's something that is really very beautiful in the data science world. You will be able to work with people in many different fields and you will be able to kind of to learn from those different fields. You will not become an expert, but as I said, you are not working alone. There is always a conversation that you can have with the people who collect the data. When you deal with data, of course, you should be able to know how to do data wrangling. You should, whatever language, programming language you learn, you also should know how to interact with databases. And I cannot emphasize the last one enough, plot, 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 plot. Look at your data from every possible angle. Um, trying to, to get a model without really inspecting the data from every possible angle is like going blindly. Um, so in a data science project, everything orbitates around the data. So you need to know your data very well. The other thing that I think is fundamental, and now these, these notions have been in the academic world for some time, and now they are also, they have been sinking in industry and governments as well. And those are the concepts of reproducibility and open source. So for those of you who are not familiar with this, according to the um, US National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, reproducibility means obtaining consistent computational results using the same input data, computational steps, methods, code, and conditions of analysis. So what it means is that for good or for bad, whatever analysis or whatever report you have created, you can reproduce it the same as many times as you want. That will ensure that if you go back 
three months after you have finished this project and your boss tells you, okay, now we need to run this with an updated data set, you can simply run everything that you have done with the updated data set and you hopefully will get a similar result. But when you run your analysis with the exactly same data set that you used the first time, you should be able to reproduce your report. And that will help you if there is any error problem to also reproduce that error and problem and being able to kind of fix it. Reproducibility goes hand in hand with something which is called open source code, um, which um, can be explained as um, code where its authors make it available to others and there's some open license so that the code can be viewed, copy, inspect and altered by others. So this is also something that I have, I, I believe has contributed to the explosion of the data science world, um, built on the work of others, um, being able to see how other people have worked on a project, what is the code they have used, um, and, and also to be able to share your code and, and get feedback from other people. I, I think this one is, is something fundamental and critical in, in the data science world. So for those of you who are um, maybe not that familiar, so some examples of version control. Version control are systems that allow you to keep the history of the project. So you can always go back to any previous steps, or you can share your project with other people and collaborate together. So one example is Git. Maybe some of you have heard about GitHub and um, Bitbucket. So those are all version control systems that allows you to share. Um, and collaborate with other people. And open source code, um, open uh, software examples are R and Python. These are two of them, but there are some others. So why, why reproducibility is important? I, I already told you that, yeah, it's great if you come back to your project three months after you have concluded, you can rerun the analysis. But also um, more and more, there is the need to create what is called reproducible workflows. So a reproducible workflow, we can think of it as like a three block. So in, in a reproducible, reproducible workflow, you will take your data, you will do whatever you have to do with the data in order to be able to analyze the data, then you will analyze the data and then you will produce a report to communicate your findings. So the beauty of reproducible workflows is that allows you to integrate the report and the analysis in a single document. So you don't have to export things from Excel into Word, and then there can be some, um, maybe one day you forgot to click on this in Excel. So in a reproducible workflow, everything will be coded and you will always be able to reproduce by just kind of um, running a report. So th this is something that more and more um, companies are using. Also, it makes, um, it, it, it facilitates when new people come into a company and, and they, they need to update things that have been done by others to have a reproducible workflow is something that is very valuable. And um, a reproducible workflow in, in, in a nutshell is a little bit what I told you, you can have a report, you can have your code and, and, and you can in your code, you will read your data, you will clean your data, you will do your analysis, you will write all the things in your report. So then you click enter in your computer and a report is produced. So if you get uh, a new updated data, you can simply like read the new data and you will get kind of a new report. So that is something that you can do when you are maybe only using a programming language, but when you work outside of academia in big projects, in big data science projects, usually the, the, the players are, there is someone who works in R, there is someone who works in Python, someone is, has to, to incorporate those things into Java and someone else use C++. So the, the, the projects becomes very complex and documenting how all these different pieces of the project they work together is something that is is essential to to reproducibility and also to the longevity of the project um so data science can be very complex involve multidisciplinary team and each person on the team works in in a piece of the puzzle and just to make sure 
when a year pass and, and you need to go back to this project, you need to make sure that the instructions about how to connect all these pieces, they are kind of documented uh, because that will ensure not only the reproducibility of your project, but the longevity of the project, which when you work um, for companies and governments is, is essential. All right, so I, I think I have, my goal for today was just giving you a flavor about the things that are important or that I think they are important in, in the world of data science. But as you might have already realized, there are many different angles in the data science world. Um, there are people working in data science that they are specialized in computational issues. There are other people who are specialized in visualizations. There are people who are more working in modeling. So the beauty of the data science world is that it's like a very broad world where everybody can have a space if they have the, the required knowledge. So there is something that I, I, I call data science depth and that I, I just wanted to touch on. So data science come from many different backgrounds. I think we all agree on that. And there is a huge diversity in expertise and also in a specialization. But that also applies to the jobs. As I said just now, there is so many possible jobs in data science that they focus on different aspects of the data science world. Um, one thing to me that is essential is that you know your strengths and your limitation. Know what you know and be aware about what you don't know. Don't autopilot. Um, and when I say don't autopilot, I know now we, there is so many software available. There is also all the software open sources available out there. But remember, it's not just only about driving. It's about being the driver, but also being the mechanic. Know that the tools that you are using are correct and adequate for the problem at hand. So you need to know what you are doing and, and keep on learning. So just think about a cake. If your job making this cake is to cut the strawberries that are at the top layer, that's what you need to know. If that is your job, and probably that's what you need to know. But if you want to be able to make the whole cake, there are some of the things that you need to know. So when I and come back to this autopilot, the depth of your knowledge will, will kind of determine the kind of things that you can do and will determine your uh, depth as a data scientist. So um, last but not least, and this is again related to what I said just now, for me in the data science world, is it is essential to know how to solve things, but most importantly, to know why you are doing things. Um, running a computer command maybe will give you an output, but you need to know why you are running it. You need to know if, you, if what you are doing is correct and under which circumstances and hypothesis is correct. So that's why when, the astronauts, they get sent into a rocket outside of um, the atmosphere. They know how to pilot the rocket, but they also know how to repair the, the rocket. So this to me is really essential. And with this, I would very much like to conclude, conclude the, co the talk. And thank you very much for your attention. And there is a GitHub website over there, which is where you can see the, the code. For the, for the slides and hope you enjoy and feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Patricia, thank you so much for that, that talk. It was, it was very engaging. I'll make a couple of comments and then I'd like to uh, take us into the Q&A uh, period. Um, you, you sent shivers down my spine at one point when you referred to Fortran. I, I remember my early days at university uh, studying Fortran. Uh, it was, I, th I think actually for someone who's not um, of the programming variety, it can almost be traumatic. Um, uh, and so, you know, maybe that brought up some, 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 some images of uh, code that didn't work and so on. But I think what I really took away from this session was the overarching positioning of data analysis and data science within a broader 
topic of, of project management. And that's, uh, for me, that's what really resonated in, in what you, you, you talked about. You talked about managing expectations with, with collaborators. You talked about different specialists, different people from different disciplines coming together. Uh, the import, importance of learning to speak one another's languages so that, and I'm not talking about coding languages now, I'm talking about you know, the languages of their professions, of their, of their, as we've spoken in the past, of their, of their métier, so that we can get those goals aligned so that things get done and work is done um, efficiently. And, and I found that uh, extremely um, useful because I think it's, it's, that's not just something that happens in data science. That's something actually, it's a generalized skill that, that we need across the board. Also, you described your, your journey through your career. And as we've spoken in the past, this, this reminds me of uh, an awful lot of professional development that takes place. You, you begin in a field uh, and you take your baby steps, you know, you learn Fortran and basic, and then you move on to C++ and, and so on. And eventually you reach a sort of a professional maturity and that may, that may take 10 years of, of application. I mean, dentists, reservoir engineers, lawyers, we all have a certain pathway that needs to be followed. But what you've demonstrated so clearly today is that when you eventually reach that level of aptitude where you've mastered your domain, you've mastered your field, uh, in fact, the game changes again, the rules change again, and you need to move into this multidisciplinary uh, space. And so it's not surprising that many of the questions that we have um, actually come from people who are not of necessarily the data science discipline, but feel that they need to swat up on this area. They feel like they need to develop these skills. So one of the first questions that came through from uh, Georgina Clancy was, do you have any tips for self-teaching, um, the self-teaching of statistical programs? Are there, are there websites or tools that people should perhaps look at first if they want to get a deeper understanding of this area? Well, yeah, there is a lot of information out there. It's, sometimes it's hard to filter what is good and what is not so good. And um, that's what happens with the internet. Um, so there are, there are resources out there, but also the universities, like for example, Monash, we have kind of courses that they are not a degree that can help people who are interested in, in learning data science or business analytics or things like that that yeah can help like focusing the career um so you know pinpoint a single resource would be very difficult for me because there are certain resources that are good for something in particular you know statistic data science as i explained is a very broad um field so probably to start with what i would mention is like look at the people who are good in the area within data science that you are interested, go and look at the GitHub repositories because the people who, who are good in, in this field, they will mostly have their projects available there. So you can learn from there. There is, for example, if you are interested in R, there is a very vibrant community. Um, everything is open source. There is lots of um, resources out there related to, to R and, and, and the usage of different statistical methods. So it's, it strikes me that what, what you've explained is that there's a there's a huge universe of different tools out there, and actually, uh, for someone like uh, the, who's posed that question, in fact, it'd be someone like me, and I'm sure many of the, the audience. What we really need is a is a navigational map that that says, look, if you're solving this kind of question, you really should be looking at this kind of software or this this kind of uh, technique. Um, so maybe there's there's work to be done on that. Um, I agree with you. I we we have some fantastic micro credentialing courses at Monash, uh, which will give people uh, a good introduction, even if they're not specialists in this area. So I encourage our listeners to have a look at that online. Um, there was a question also about how. Well, let's have a look at this. It says, "Can you have a data scientist that is not a programmer?" Okay, so. That, that might be more where I would like to be. I prefer not to program. Are there analytical tools that allow someone with a business background 
that doesn't have an aptitude for coding to become a data scientist and focused on analyzing data and drawing insights rather than get caught up in the nitty gritties of code. So Patricia, this is, this is a handout from people like me. What, what, what can we do? I don't know, uh, like for me, I'm, I'm like, a, 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 it's what I said, the autopiloting is not a good idea because it can take you very far. Uh, you know, it depends again in what you want to do. If you want to kind of learn to visualize the data and, and you are not that interested into the modeling, maybe you can use some kind of like ready-made tools, but if you really want to be a data scientist of any depth, you really need to know how to code. For me, I think that is essential because the things that are ready out there, they are limited. So you will always need to, to, to learn how to code and everybody can learn. So there is this myth of, I hate coding, but it can be fun. And, and I, I think it's like any other thing, anyone can learn it. So perhaps the message there is that um, not everyone will become data scientists, but uh, for people who don't particularly like programming, there are a number of skills and capabilities that you can develop so that you can partner with data scientists that will, that will enable you to, to move forward. Um, there was a question also uh, with the masters from Ruben, would the masters in data science at Monash University prepare you enough for the job industry? That's a very open question. It really depends on what job you're looking for, but Patricia, perhaps you could talk a little bit about where that might take people. So uh, like, I'm not, like 100% familiar with the Master of Data Science. I'm more familiar with the Master of Business Analytics, which is kind of like also looking at data science, but more from the business perspective. So a Master of, of the Master of Business Analytics that we teach at Monas, it does definitely prepare you for the, the real world um, experience because it teaches you how to code it, is, it teaches you how to visualize data. It also teaches you about the models and, and, and the statistical theory and the need, and also it tells you how to tell a story of a project. So it's one, I, I think our master is a master that has kind of look at all these things that I pointed during the presentation that are important, that in the past, like for example, when I studied, we did not learn when we study at the university. So I think the probably the data science, the master of data science has similar um, similar things. But as I said, I'm more familiar with the master of business analytics. So we have a question from someone who's in the IT space, but not, not within the, the, the area of data analytics. And the, the, the question hinges around what would I need to do if I want to change into data, the, into the data analysis uh, career path, and I think uh, as a side, as a side question to that, um, what collateral can I bring from a broader understanding of the IT uh, discipline that would enable me to create a competitive advantage in for my for me in my career in in data science? What synergies? Do you see there and what what exciting spaces of interaction do you see between data science and, and IT going forward? I think there are a lot. Um, I remember in my time um, outside of academia, I, I had situations in which I partner with kind of like computer scientists um, to create like really amazing projects that I could have not done it myself on my own because you know, I, I'm not, I don't program in Java or things like that. Whereas this person was an expert. So we kind of, we joined forces and developed something that either him alone or myself alone, we could not have developed. So I, I think there is a lot of synergy between computer science and data um, science. Um, that Definitely there is a space to, to learn maybe a little bit more on the statistical modeling, if that is the aspects of data science that you are interested, but having a, a very good like computer science background will kind of allow you to learn, for example, R or Python very quickly. And also your skills can be very helpful when especially dealing with big data and, and, and making things going faster. So, so definitely there is a lot of synergy between 
um, computer science and, and data science, and, and, and both disciplines can, can grow together. And I, and I would argue that actually um, each one of the other disciplines has has a has a contribution to make. I mean, you raised earlier raised the point earlier that it's really important to ask the right questions. So, if people have got a really thorough training in business by way of an MBA or an advanced degree in management, um, they should be able to identify, if you like, the key human questions around the business model that will help specify the problem that the data scientist or the data analyst needs to work on. And Patricia, you were you delightfully gave that example earlier of being given the wrong problem or the wrong data set and having to rework things. So in fact, there is that need to have that, that crossover, that, that fertilization. Uh, Deb asked a question, again, back to the Master of Business Analytics at Monash. What programming languages can they expect to become confident in upon completion? So in the Master of Business Analytics, we focus on R. Um, and, but for example, the, the main players nowadays in data science it would be R and Python. Uh, you know, companies like Uber, Google, um, all these companies, they use both. So in our masters, we focus on R, but like if you know R very well, it's kind of like not that hard to, to move between R and Python. So in our masters, we focus on R, but as I said, um, with the knowledge that people will acquire when they finish and also throughout the, the master, they will have no problem to pick up Python, for example. And I think it's it's often said that if you master a specific language, uh, the principles can be replicated elsewhere. I remember after studying Fortran, I was given the chance to play with uh, Pascal. Gosh, that makes me feel old. But and there was a lot of there was a lot of knowledge. There was a lot of skills that were that were transferable. Um, I have a question also from from an academic colleague who asks about um, a move to and from industry. Um, and you actually have a fascinating background in that sense, Patricia, because you've made that journey, um, which I think more of us should do. Um, what, what guidance uh, would you provide? And is there a skills expectation mismatch between academia and the, and the private sector or, or government? Um, and how do we address these going forward? Yeah, there are. I, I remember my my motivation was, yeah, when I was a lecturer at UQ in 2013, I, I realized, oh my God, I was teaching this kind of course across different science fields. And I have thousands of students from, you know, many different backgrounds. And, and I realized I'm talking to all these people. I never had myself experience into any of these fields. So I felt like, there was like I didn't there was a gap between my knowledge and, and, and the knowledge of these other people. So that's why I, I went to industry. And yeah, when I move from academia to industry, there is a gap. There is a gap because in academia we are used to um, you know looking to this problem and look we have time to look in the problem. We go into these theoretical things. When you move into industry, the problems land on your desk. You have to multitask. You have to be extremely organized to be able to, to cope with all this. You need to forget a little bit about your academic language and you need to learn the language that is used in, in, in the corporate world. So definitely there is, I, I don't think the, the transition is smooth. You, there are a lot of things that you need to learn. But for me, I found it fascinating. I really would never regret to have done that move um, and, and I, I was always kind of convinced that I wanted to come back to academia. So during my time outside of academia, I, what I did was I tried to get exposed to as many different problems as possible. So my last job at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, any day, any given day, anyone could just rock up in my office and ask me a question about whatever method, which I might not even remember. So, you know, that, that exposure to many different problems, to many different types of data, is something that I, would, I could have never acquired if I stayed only in academia. 
So there's a there's a real nudge, isn't there, as you you move out of the specialization of academia, which is good because it gives you incredible depth. But as you move into into an applied setting, um, it does require you to broaden your expertise and be more nimble, more prepared to 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 hop across disciplines. I think that's a a terrifically valuable skill for academics and for people in, in the private sector, the depth and the breadth optimization argument. Um, we have a question here from an autodidact, someone who has trained themselves in this space. Um, he says, or she says, my problem is there's no chance to apply the knowledge self-learned. Any suggestions? So this is someone who's, who's come up with some, some good skills, um, but is feeling the same sort of urge that the last question uh, was requesting. Uh, how do I how do I branch out? How do I now that I've mastered my my field of expertise? How do I reach out to others and provide a service uh, from my from with with my skill set? So uh, that one I, I can understand. So, for example, um, well, I don't know what is the background of this person, but let's say this person is a psychologist and has has her or himself trained into kind of the more quantitative tools. So, one one way to get into the data science would be to to get into into the data science related to your original background, because that will immediately give you the credibility of the psych psychology, and then you can you will have the opportunity to demonstrate those skills that you have acquired, the, the, the quantitative and the data science skills. And, and of course, it's one step at a time. Once you get the first opportunity, then you keep on learning and you keep on demonstrating what you have learned. So what I would say for people who come from a different background into the data science background is that try to get into your original field, but into the quantitative part of that field. Because nowadays, there is no field that has no data. That's a very bold statement, Patricia. Really, do all fields have data? Most of the fields have data. Or, or they, Most if, of the fields. If they don't have data, they will use data to actually answer certain questions. Now, maybe they don't, they don't collect the data, but they might use data from other you know, domains to answer questions in their field. So what we're really talking about here is analogous thinking. So taking insights where there is a good understanding and a good source of data and using that to model and, in, and interpret what's happening elsewhere. That strikes me as, uh, as, a, as a, burgeoning, a burgeoning area. Um, there's a question here about um, the difference between data analysts and data science scientists. And I, I like this question because um, it says, do some companies call their data analyst positions data science positions? even though there's not much data science there as a way to attract top talent. I know, even myself, I don't sometimes don't know how to describe my expertise. So, you know, for me, anything that is data science, data analyst, everything is related to this broad definition that I gave at the beginning is someone who uses data to answer questions and uses some sort of statistical, computational, or mathematical methods to whatever that they are. So I think one thing is the, the, the name of the role. The other thing is what are the, 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 the skills that the role requires. And mostly they are kind of similar. So yeah, I personally, sorry, I personally don't like to make the, the kind of, this is data science, this is data analyst, you know, all these kind of, definitions they become close together so i'm more of the opinion that there is this big data science or data analyst it, it's it's not what you call yourself it's it's what you do um look i and i think that that's actually quite a nice point for us to to conclude um obviously this is an emerging and dynamic field uh it's a profession which is redefining itself in leaps and bounds as new technologies and new approaches come forward in response to the new problems that we have to solve. Uh, and we've just seen in 2020, how many new problems there are for data scientists and data analysts uh, to get on top of in all sorts of disciplines. 
Patricia, thank you so much. Um, it's been a real, real pleasure to have this uh, discussion today. And to our audience, we look forward very much to seeing you in 2021. Uh, please look after yourselves and if you can, someone else as well. Thank you.